But the executive branch of the United States government does not just include the presidency. It also includes, well, the government, essentially the bureaucracy. When we speak about bureaucracy, in my mind and many minds of people my generation, comes the classical sim from the Asterix uh, cartoon. It's one, maybe one of the best representations of the popular view of the bureaucracy and how to feel to tangle with it. And it is true that many of us have such horror stories. Lost files that require us to redo application process. That help for getting a visa for the USA. Long quays at the DMV. And everybody's favorite pastime, making the taxes. All of this is part of the executive branch of the United States government. And yet the fact is that many of the things we take for granted in our life are run and maintained by bureaucrats. Think about one of the simplest things, the value of the dollar in your wallet. The fact that you can use this as a legal tender without a need to persuade people all the time that it is not counterfeit, yeah, not backed by the US companies, because a vast army of federal bureaucrats keep an eye out and go after counterfeiters. Every and all members of the civil service will be considered bureaucrats, from the simple cleaner to the clerk to the cabinet uh, secretary. We do not see them as such, and politicians have incentives to present their favorite civil servants as something nobler, but they all are. Uh, that includes soldiers, their civil servants, FBI people, Secret Service people, the people who prepare grandma's pension, IRS, uh, health and safety people. All of them are bureaucrats. All of them are civil servants. Yes, every soldier in the US Army, including you if you had served, you were a bureaucrat at that point. But as I said, politicians have incentives to hide that when they're trying to present uh, and promote their favorite part of the bureaucracy. And the reality is that bureaucrats pay a terrible price from a democratic point of view for this position. Yes, they get a lot of job security, very good uh, compensation packages, but Federal civil servants, and that includes soldiers, police officers, what have you not, okay, have curtailed right of free speech, no permission to run for public office, no permission to have leadership roles in campaigns. But the question holds, what exactly is a bureaucracy? And again, we're talking about the biggest part of the executive branch. Uh, a bureaucracy is an organization characterized by hierarchical structure, worker specialization, explicit rules, and advancement by merit. This definition was presented by the German sociologist Max Weber, perhaps one of the most important social scientists ever. Now let us open this up a bit. Hierarchical means that a bureaucracy is a top-down organization. Orders come from above, and there is a diminishing level of responsibility as we go down the hierarchy or the ladder. Everybody knows who they report to and from where can they receive legitimate instructions. Specialization means that every person in the hierarchy has a spe very specific job. Indeed, they may be the only person tasked with that job and they are expected to do that job and nothing else. A bureaucrat is a full-time specialist. Uh, think how different that is from, let us say, a small business owner that has to juggle various specialities at the same time. Now, bureaucracy, nobody's supposed to be juggling. They're supposed to be doing one specific task and nothing else. Now, when it comes to explicit rules, a bureaucracy has explicit rules telling everybody what their position in the hierarchy is and what their job is. This helps things become routine and avoid the time-consuming process of trying to create positions and rules on the go. These rules are public and are written. And finally, meritocracy. Some might find it funny, but a true bureaucracy is supposed to be staffed by people who are chosen by non-political, non-arbitrary means. From the time of ancient China, the usual system is examinations or processes that are clearly laid forth and for which no deviation is supposed to happen. Furthermore, a bureaucracy has a non-political uh, non rules for advancement. This may be seniority, further exams, etc. The important point is that you're not supposed to have to rely on subjective, arbitrary political criteria for your career. Now, of course, 
reality can be different. Meritocracy is actually very important. If the bureaucracy is stuffed at the whim of the political elites, it, you, it, if you think it at the whim of us, the people, then it really is nothing more than just another extension of partisan politics. The spoil system was such a system. Whoever held political power was supposed to use the bureaucracy to reward supporters. People will get fired for no reason than that they were not Republicans or Democrats, as essentially the whole bureaucracy will be changed every four or eight years. Not only did that harm stability, but it's also made the system inefficient. Bureaucrats did not care so much about their jobs as about satisfying their political bosses. Think of the police not so much caring about law and order, but making the life easier for the current mayor or president. Well, this is how the U.S. Civil Service was stopped for most of our history. Maybe the most characteristic case of this was Tammany Hall in New York. The fight against the spoil systems in New York became emblematic of a national fight for a professional civil service. Cartoonists like Thomas Nast threw their hat into the ring as seen in the cartoon put in the PowerPoint. Many people saw the system of spoils and patronage as injurious to liberty and the quality of democracy in the American Republic, as votes could be bought in the most base manner, and the public would be made to vote against his interest by supporting politicians in return for jobs. The big break came from the most unlikely source. When President Chester A. Arthur and Congressperson George H. Pendleton, who was racist, by the way, created the first act for a professional civil service in reaction to the assassination of President Garfield by a disaffected person who had been denied a spoiled job. It's the so-called Pendleton Act of 1883. Until then, they were all quite happy to play the game, but, uh, you know, getting a president killed, problematic. And yet, we have to understand something. There is a central paradox in democratic states having bureaucracy. A bureaucracy is a system where expertise, not popular will, is prized above all else. Decisions are made by obeying rules, not democratic votes. Indeed, indeed, early thinkers of Republican theory distrusted bureaucracies, which were initially A, a French invention, B, a French invention by an absolute monarch. But still, things need to get done, and we cannot spend all our day voting decisions. So since time is a valuable resource, we delegate to experts. This has its costs and its benefits. Efficient government requires a bureaucracy, and uh, getting things even-handed, uh, that means having neutral competence, also requires it. And we also need experts. People tend to think, I know everything in the world, but I assure you, as somebody who has a PhD, has lived for 41 years in the world, I don't know everything in the world, you don't, need a, you don't know everything in the world, you need experts. On the other hand, bureaucracies do get characterized by a lack of transparency, the rules uh, that run them can be very vexing to understand for a person outside it, and thus can hide what's going on. There's the issue of accountability. Are the bureaucrats accountable to we, the people? Are they accountable to their political bosses? Are they accountable to their uh, actual uh, bureaucratic bosses? Or are they accountable to each other? I mean, they are ultimately are uh, agents, we are the principals, but they are essentially agents that work for agents that work for agents that work for us, the principals. And of course, red tape, bureaucratic rules can become so expansive, and especially the lack of transparency and issue of accountability can help that, that they, instead of making efficient government, they make it inefficient and make our lives hard. The U.S. federal bureaucracy is huge. It is made up by no less than 3 million employees, or about 1% of the country's population. What is it made up of? Well, the first part are departments. They are headed by people appointed by the president and accepted by Congress. They tend to arise in reaction to three causes. Essential functions usually laid out in the Constitution, the Department of Defense, and uh, the Secretary of State, 
usually come out of that. Demands by the nation for government action, which is the essence of democracy. You know, if we want a department to be made and vote for it, the government should make it. And demands of clientele or special interest groups. There are 15 departments. An example is the Department of State. After that, there are the independent agencies, quasi-departments with very specialized and narrow jurisdictions. There's a whole bunch of them and Congress likes them because they can be kept more independent from the president and the judicial branch than departments. An example is the Social Security Administration. Then there are independent regulatory boards and commissions. Their task is to regulate specific sectors of the economy. A lot of this arose with the New Deal under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. As you can guess, these are the sites of massive, epic, and nasty political battles as various groups, groups try to get regulations that make their economic life easier or that of their competitors harder. There are 38 such agencies. An example of this is the Securities and Exchange Commission. And finally, there are government corporations like Amtrak. Indeed, some people would say there are too many of them and would like to see the bureaucracy of the federal government and another name, the executive branch, curtailed a bit in size. Are you tired of government picking favorites in business? Is red tape making it impossible for you to earn a living? When private businesses collude with the government to exclude competition, you get cronyism. How do you get rid of it? You can try passing laws, but that only covers up the problem. There's a better solution. Hi, Willie Bays here with another fantastic product, Crony Clean. The spray that breaks down cronyism by breaking down government bureaucracy. Normal products attack the side effects of cronyism by passing more laws and business regulations. But Crony Clean is different. It targets the root cause of cronyism, too much government. Using proven political science, Crony Clean eliminates the government influence on business, giving everyone the right to make a living. No more concentrated benefits, no more dispersed costs. America! Why waste your time and money fighting an uphill battle against special interest groups? With Crony Clean, you have the power to fight. Crony Clean can be applied to restore economic liberty, property rights, the First Amendment, and much more. Order now and receive Crony Clean for the unbelievable price of nothing. Just pay fewer taxes. But wait, there's more. Call in the next 20 minutes and you'll receive a free gift, the Dollar Deflator. It forms a strong barrier to protect your dollar savings from inflation. Keep America free by keeping the government out of businesses. Order now. Offer not available in Washington, D.C. and surrounding areas. Side effects may include more economic freedom, jobs, less corruption, and improved quality of life. If you're a politician or lobbyist, please consult your doctor before using Crony Clean. Order today. Now, what do all of those bureaucracies do? Well, they first of all administer. Administer means essentially uh, using the resources provided to them by Congress. And according to the uh, general direction given them by the president, they essentially use those resources in order the, to get out results uh, to implement policies. Uh, that's the basic executive uh, function of the executive. That's the very function of the executive. The administration is what executes the laws made by Congress. But they don't just do that. They also make rules. Bureaucratic discretion is essentially the attitude of the judicial branch uh, and the Congress to provide essentially some leeway for the bureaucracy to create new rules that are not laws, but nevertheless have binding power laws to the citizens to which they apply. This is done on the justification of providing the bureaucracy with the ability to react to unforeseen circumstances without having to wait for the long period of uh, legislation by Congress. Unfortunately, though, that also means that once you make rules, you have to find a way to adjudicate whether rules have been violated. And that also leads to the bureaucracy having adjudication powers through administrative courts. And all of this is scary because it impacts all elements of who, what, how of politics. And it literally means that the bureaucracy has executive, 
legislative and judicial power, violating thus the idea of the separation of powers in Congress. One important difference between the state of Nevada and the United States when it comes to administrative law is that in the state of Nevada, there is Constitution Article 3, Section 2, administrative regulations are under the review of the legislative department. While technically Congress has the same power in Nevada that is spelled out in the Constitution. Politics inside a bureaucracy is dominated by bureaucratic culture, a set of ideas of how the job should be done, what the goals are, and how civil servants should behave. It can even include a specific bureaucratic language, like the military's acronym infused speech. Due to policy commitment, adoption of a certain behavior, specialization, and ultimately identification with the agency one works for, transparency and accountability can be hampered. Bureaucrats are proud and committed to their jobs. They have an incentive to do so, since usually internal reviews are key to promotion. Being a team player is highly prized. However, as a result, they have a hard time working with organizations with no such culture and accommodating civil society requests, something exemplified by the issue of whistleblowing, or even worse, covering criminal behavior by cover-ups or colleagues, something that tends to happen a lot in the police force. Finally, bureaucracies can be riven by conflicts between people appointed by the head of the executive, the president, and people who are career civil servants. More serious are conflicts between agencies, for example, the FBI versus the CIA and the Department of State versus Department of Defense, that can lead to politicized conflicts in Congress as different Congress presidents champion different agencies in what is essentially a turf war, but really a war over funds, rather than uh, decisions based on uh, policy imperatives and rational thinking about what needs to be done. Then you have the problem of agency capture, where certain political or economic interest through Congress are able to place, or through the president, are able to place their partisans in control of agencies and use those agencies then to uh, promote their particularistic interests rather than the interest of the country as a whole. And finally, you have many cases where the president and bureaucrats are at loggerhead. This especially happens when a president has very libertarian ideas about the economy or the federal government, which can quickly lead to stalemate in the ability of the executive to get something, which if you add to stalemate in Congress because of polarization, you can quickly see the federal government grinding to a halt. All of this comes down to the idea of the Iron Triangle. And this is the most important concept to understand about the federal bureaucracy or any state bureaucracy. Now, the idea of the Iron Triangle is that activist groups, whether lobbyists or other political groups, cooperate with Congress persons on an oversight committee, that is a committee of Congress whose job is to make sure that the bureaucracy is not violating its mission. So they cooperate with the Congress persons on an oversight committee to influence the policy of the bureaucracy in that committee. In return, the bureaucracy gets special treatment from lobbies or other groups and Congress. In many cases that might also mean extra funding in the budget. The losers in this story are the general public. Such triangles are usually formed by special interest groups, which can more easily organize their political action to influence policymakers and bureaucrats. It's called an iron triangle because then civil society groups and other citizens cannot break through the sides of the triangle. And as a result, you end having the bureaucracy promoting policies that the majority of the people consider wrong-headed. And this is one of the reasons why people don't like bureaucrats. But it's also one of the results of the way that democracy works, where especially a democracy like America, where small minorities of activists whether they are right-wing or left-wing activists, it's unimportant, dominate the political process by being active, calling Congress presidents, going out and voting in primaries, midterm elections, and so on. If citizens want the Iron Triangle to break, they have to overwhelm the influence of the activists on Congress persons. They have to go out there and they have to do their job as citizens. Okay, so that's all about the federal bureaucracy. Let's take a look now at the Nevada Executive Department, okay? Um, and uh, 
the Vada has an interesting history with executives. It had a lot of problems with Utah territorial government. And as a result, there were some interesting decisions made in the constitution of the Vada that make it quite different from the United States of America executive. The most important difference is while the executive in Nevada is not a collegiate executive, like the one of Switzerland that we talked uh, in the previous lecture about, it's also not a personalist. It is not an executive headed by one person. Instead, it has a plural executive, including a governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, secretary of state, treasurer, controller, plus two other positions that originally existed but then were taken away uh, with uh, amendments. And it's very interesting. It's actually quite interesting that they didn't go for a collegiate uh, type of executive like the one Switzerland had, uh, but instead did this weird mix between the United States system and a more collegiate system through the plural executive. Now, why did they do that? Well, they did it because they wanted to make it harder for the executive to, to be controlled by one person because of their bad memories of the Utah territorial government and Brigham Young. And they also wanted to make it harder for the executive uh, department to dominate the state government. So it was all in the services of uh, separation of powers and checks and balances. Now, how did they try to do that? Well, by making all members of the plural executive elected by the people directly. Okay, and at different elections. So the elections would happen at the same time, but were different from each other. Uh, so there was no requirement that, for example, all of the members uh, running be from the same party and so on. The other requirement is that you have to be 25 years or old at least to serve in one of these positions. You have to be an elector, you have to have the right to vote, and you have to be a resident of the state for at least two years. Um, there are four-year terms uh, for all of them, and their term limits the governor has a term limit of two terms plus two years of a partial term in case they were lieutenant governor serving for a governor that had to leave or something happened to them. The lieutenant governor has 12 years total, so essentially three terms and all others just two terms with no partial terms. So if you served, for example, two years filling up for a previous member, let's say uh, for a previous treasurer, then that counts as a full term and you only have one more term to run. So they all have Different term limits, they all through serve for four years, so every four years all of the members of the exec plural executive are for elections and they're elected differently from each other. Now, despite the fact that the governor is not like the U.S. president, there's only just one person among the plural executive, they are still the technical leader of the executive. They play the role of chief executive, chief of state, and chief legislator, and their commander in chief of the Nevada National Guard. And the fact that they also consider the state party chief. So if they're a Democrat, they're supposed to lead the Democrats in Nevada. If they're a Republican, they're supposed to lead Republicans in Nevada, and they are also supposed to give them jobs. Okay. Historically, there have been 15 Republican governors, 12 Democrat governors, and four silver or silver Democrat governors. Now, in his or her role as chief executive, the governor appoints executive department officials, which is about 280 positions in the Nevada government. And it's a good opportunity to satisfy the state party by appointing state party activists or members to these various positions. Uh, and in a way, the governor of Nevada has an easier job at doing this than the United States president because Unlike the president who needs the consent and advice of the Senate for his appointments to the federal government or her appointments to the federal government or their appointments to the federal government, the Nevada government does not need the confirmation of the legislator. They just appoint you and that's it. They are also members of several state boards and commissions. But however, beyond that, they have little authority over their other elected colleagues. They cannot really order around the other members of the plural executive. And uh, this makes it very hard to get things done sometimes in Nevada, so it protects you from authoritarian government, because 75% of the time you have divided government, at least one other member of the plural executive being from the other party. The governor is also the chief of state. That's a less impressive thing than the U.S. president. I mean, they go around and do various media uh, appearances, you know, ribbon cuttings. They represent the state in discussions with other governors or the federal government. And generally speaking, these are 
media things to try to like, you know, get the governor to show that the state is doing well and everything. But, you know, it's not as important as the president. I mean, probably most Nevadans will react more to the president visiting their town than the governor visiting their town. That's just probably a reality. But maybe I'm overstating. You guys can tell me that. Um, finally, the governor also plays the role of chief legislator. Uh, he influences legislation via state uh, of others, which is mandated by the Constitution, by budget proposals. Uh, Nevada uses a central clearing system. Uh, so every uh, budget demand of uh, part of the executive has to go through the governor. And that gives you some control or her control. Also, the governor has an advantage over the legislature when it comes to budgets in that the governor, the executive, has a much better idea about the needs of the state uh, in budgets. While the legislators, especially because most of them are part-timers, they might not be able to question the budgets that arrive to them. So usually they pass the budget because they just don't have enough time with just 120 days to debate the budget and look into it. The governor can convene special sessions of the legislator. The power what used to be exclusive. Now also the legislator has it. Uh, the governor can also adjourn the legislator if the two chambers are in conflict over time of adjournment. And the governor also can veto legislation, but it's more, it's more likely for their veto to be overridden than the presidential one. About 15% of the time, the veto is overridden uh, for the Nevada governor, while in comparison for the US president, it's only about 1% of the time. The lieutenant governor is a position that is largely not very important. There were some problems in the past concerning how long the governor must be out of state for the lieutenant governor to take over created a huge ruckus uh, and led to a court case. You can read more about it in the book. Uh, beyond that, not much. I mean, they're the chair of Commission of Tourism and into other boards, and that's it. I have a feeling John Adams, the first US vice president, would find this even more boring than being the US vice president. More important is the Attorney General. They sit on three boards and provide advisory legal opinion. They defend the state or prosecute cases uh, in the Nevada Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court, just like the U.S. Attorney General. Technically, they oversee district attorneys, but most of the time they stay out of it since those are also elected and are appointed by him or her or them. Uh, so they try to stay out of it, except it's something egregious. And they submit biannual reports on the condition of law enforcement in the state. Finally, we have the Secretary of State, uh, who is the custodian of state records, must sign gold grants and commissions, is on two boards, and also has duties concerning elections, creation of businesses in Nevada, and public notaries. And then we have the controller and treasurer, who pretty much have to work together managing the money received and disbursed by the state and taking care of about the bookkeeping of state accounts. And that's it. That's the Nevada executive. Of course, there are many cabinets, there are many state commissions and so on, but I don't want you to, you know, focus too much on that. Just understand right now how the Nevada executive is different from the United States of America executive. 